it's been helpful to me personally in helping understand and follow some of the key economic issues. What many of you may not realize if you're not uh, steeped in this kind of stuff the way I am is how much of a uh, pillar of modern macro rich really is. Anybody who reads a contemporary article about monetary policy, especially with an international dimension, flip to the bibliography and you'll see at least several entries of Richard Clarida's name there. Um, Rich uh, joined Columbia, um, Columbia's economics faculty in 1988. Um, before that, he had a short stint on the Council of Economic Advisors, but his next service in public, uh, his next stint in public service was in the George W. Bush administration in the um, early 2000s when he was Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy. That's when I first got to know Rich. Um, after that, he uh, went to work for PIMCO as a managing director and as their sort of in-house chairman of the Federal Reserve. Uh, and so um, you always need to listen carefully to everything Rich says, because not only does it carry the weight of being a monetary policymaker, but it's steeped in really the frontier of what we know about monetary economics. So Rich, uh, please come on up and th thanks for coming. Well, thank you for the opportunity to join you bright and early on this January Thursday morning. As some of you may know, I am a longtime member of the Council on Foreign Relations and have attended and participated in many of these events over the past 20 years. In fact, Les Gell brought me in, uh, and I'm forever grateful. Although I will point out that in my previous visits to the podium, I was in the somewhat less demanding position of asking the questions rather than answering them. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation and the Q&A, but before I sit down with Greg, I would like to first share with you some thoughts about the outlook for the U.S. economy and for monetary policy. The U.S. economy begins the year 2020 in a good place. The unemployment rate is at a 50-year low. Inflation is close to our 2% objective, GDP growth is solid, and the FOMC's baseline outlook is for a continuation of this performance in 2020. At present, PCE inflation is running somewhat below our 2% objective, but we project that under appropriate monetary policy, inflation will rise gradually to our symmetric 2% objective. Although the unemployment rate is at a 50-year low, Wages are rising broadly in line with productivity growth and underlying inflation. And we are not seeing any evidence to date that a strong labor market is putting excessive cost push pressure on price inflation. Committee projections for the U.S. economy are similar to our projections at this time one year ago. But over the course of 2019, the committee shifted the stance of U.S. monetary policy to offset some significant global growth headwinds and global disinflationary pressures. In 2019, sluggish growth abroad and global developments weighed on investment, exports, and manufacturing, although there are some indications that headwinds to global growth may be beginning to abate. U.S. inflation remains muted, PCE inflation running at 1.5%, and core PCE inflation was running at 1.6% through November, the most recent data. Moreover, inflation expectations, measured both by surveys and market prices, have moved lower and reside at the low end of a range that I myself consider consistent with our price stability mandate. The shift in the stance of monetary policy that we undertook in 2019 was, I believe, well-timed and has been providing support to the economy and helping to keep the U.S. outlook on track. I believe that monetary policy is in a good place and should continue to support sustained growth, a strong labor market, and inflation running close to our symmetric 2% objective. As long as incoming information about the economy remains broadly consistent with this outlook, the current stance of monetary policy likely will remain appropriate. 
Looking ahead, monetary policy is not on a preset course. The committee will proceed on a meeting-by-meeting -meeting basis and will be monitoring the effects of our recent policy actions, along with other information bearing on the outlook as we assess the appropriate path of the target range for the federal funds rate. Of course, if developments emerge that in the future trigger a material reassessment of our outlook, we will respond accordingly. In January of 2019, my FOMC colleagues and I affirmed that we aim to operate with an ample level of bank reserves in the U.S. financial system. And in October, we announced and began to implement a program to address pressures in the repo markets that became evident in September. To that end, we have been purchasing T-bills and conducting both overnight and term repo operations. And these efforts were successful in relieving pressures in the repo markets over the year end. As we enter 2020, let me emphasize that we stand ready to adjust the details of this program as appropriate and in line with our goal, which is to keep the federal funds rate in the target range desired by the FOMC. As the minutes of the December FOMC meeting suggest, it may be appropriate to gradually transition away from active repo operations this year as Treasury bill purchases supply a larger base of reserves. Though some repo operations may be needed at least through April when tax payments will sharply reduce reserve levels. Finally, before I sit down with Greg, allow me to offer a few words about the committee's review of our strategy tools and communications practices that we commenced in February of 2019. This review, with public engagement unprecedented for the Federal Reserve, is the first of its kind. Through 14 Fed Listens events, including an academic conference in Chicago, we have been hearing a range of perspectives, not only from academics, but also from representatives of consumer, labor, community business, and other groups. We are drawing on these insights as we assess how best to achieve and maintain maximum employment and price stability. In July of 2019, we began discussing topics associated with the review at our regularly scheduled committee meetings. And we will continue reporting on our discussions in the minutes and we'll share our conclusions with the public when we conclude the review later this year. Thank you very much for your time and attention and I look forward to my conversation with Greg and the Q&A session to follow. Thanks very much, Rich. Thank you. Um, the committee's last meeting was uh, December 11th. Uh, at the time, your colleagues had a consensus forecast of growth of about 2% for the year 2020. Uh, months later, how does that look to you? I don't think our view has really changed so much. Of course, we'll have a meeting at the end of, uh, of this month and get extensive staff uh, updates. But I think we enter 2020 uh, with the economy uh, growing at roughly a trend uh, pace. Uh, obviously, a very strong labor market, as I, I indicated. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, Greg, I do think that relative to where we were, say, in the summer and the fall, um, uh, the downside risk to the global outlook has maybe diminished uh, uh, a bit. And there's some early signs that maybe the decline in global growth is, is bottoming out. Uh, but again, our baseline projection is really for 2020, uh, in terms of GDP growth, unemployment, and inflation, uh, to be pretty similar to last year, with a proviso that we certainly are focused and in, indeed very focused on getting the uh, underlying rate of inflation in the economy back up to our 2% objective. And we do see that beginning to play out this year. Let's talk about inflation for a moment. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, the, the, the Fed has a symmetric target of 2% inflation, yeah. and yet for almost a decade now, it has consistently undershot that target. Yeah. Why is that and how worrisome is it? Well, let's talk about why it's been happening and talk about how worrying uh, it is. Uh, through much of, the, of that period, obviously the U.S. economy was still recovering from uh, the global financial crisis and recession and unemployment was elevated. So I guess it's not surprising that at least the first half of that period, maybe inflation was running a bit below our objective. But more recently, you are correct um, that even as we've approached traditional estimates of, of full employment and full 
uh, capacity. Uh, infl inflation, on average, has been running a bit below our objective, and that surprised us, and that surprised uh, five or, uh, private forecasters. I would remind you that a year ago, indeed, I arrived at the Fed in September of 2018, um, and at that point when I arrived, core inflation was actually running at our 2% uh, uh, objective. Uh, and so we have achieved 2%, uh, but I think what we've realized since I arrived at the Fed in the last 15 months um, is that the global disinflationary pressures, which I referred to, are very powerful uh, forces, uh, and policy needs to factor that in and setting policy to get uh, inflation up to the objective. Obviously, in Europe and in Japan and in many other uh, developed economies, that's been a common theme of the last uh, several years. And, and so recognizing that challenge, we definitely want to have the right policies in place. So when you look ahead to the next year, how, uh, how do you see the risks around inflation? Do you think that we're more likely to have inflation moving up closer to target or actually more concerned about risk continuing to move away from target below? So I think we want to distinguish between the baseline view and the, and the risks around that view. Uh, I think our and the private sector forecasters baseline view um, is for core measures of inflation to begin to move up towards 2%. Um, uh, percent. But I would be honest in confessing that if there is a risk to that outlook, it's skewed to the downside. Indeed, in our summary of economic projections, and we released the detail of that with the minutes uh, recently, uh, you'll see we actually ask participants four times a year uh, relative to their baseline view are the risks to inflation and output and employment to the downside or to the upside, and the skew of that distribution on the committee is to the downside. Um, how should policy, your policy stance, adjust to those risks? Is, it, is policy appropriate as it is now, given where you see those risks? If those risks materialize, should policy adjust? Well, we do think policy is appropriate. Now, let's talk a little bit about the 2019 uh, decision. So just to remind you, in July, September, and October meetings, uh, we decided to lower the federal funds rate target range by 25 basis points, so for a, a total of 75 basis points. Um, and as we indicated then, and certainly very relevant to me, one of the important reasons to undertake that adjustment um, was that we had these muted inflation pressures and we wanted to try to offset them. Uh, monetary policy operates with a lag. Milton Friedman taught us uh, certainly long and possibly variable lag. Um, and so we do think right now that policy is in a good place. Um, but as we've said, you know, um, policy is not on a preset course. Uh, and if there is a material uh, change in our outlook, we will respond accordingly. But realistically, if inflation continues to undershoot the target or even move further away from the target, yeah. is there much that the Fed can do about that? Well, we do. We think we do have the tools uh, that will be able to achieve that uh, objective. We need to be nimble and we need to be alert not only to U.S. but global uh, circumstances. Uh, as I said, these policies were just put in place. Uh, we've actually seen some indications, for example, if you look at the inflation index bond market, some pickup and break-even inflation and in survey uh, measures. And so uh, we do think that policy is appropriate and under our baseline outlook uh, will continue to be appropriate. Do you think it's possible that the risks to grow? I mean, you know, the divine coincidence, as they say in uh, economics, yeah. was that full employment was consistent with stable inflation at target. But are we seeing a breakdown of that in the, to the extent that in the coming year you could have no risks to growth and yet continued downside risks to inflation? Again, I, I, I think that is a risk case, and we're, we're certainly uh, alert uh, to that, but that is not our, our baseline view. I think this gives me an opportunity, Greg, to talk a little bit about really the remarkable uh, developments in the U.S. Uh, labor uh, market. You know, unemployment is at a 50-year uh, low, um, and yet, as I indicated in my opening uh, remarks, uh, we do not see excessive cost push uh, pressure uh, coming uh, uh, from, uh, from the labor market, and we need to be humble um, in the precision of our understanding of of full employment. Uh, the committee consistently over the past eight years has revised down its view of, of what we call U star, the rate of unemployment consistent with full employment. My personal estimate is 4%, uh, and that could easily be uh, uh, lower. Um, and so I think the committee has exhibited uh, an attention to the data, and as the data has shown that the economy can operate with lower unemployment uh, than we might have thought several years ago, uh, we are factoring that into, in, into policy, and that's a very, that's a very good thing. 
I think the other thing the committee has adjusted is the view on the neutral interest rate. Yeah. Uh, the neutral rate, of course, the one that's consistent with full employment and stable inflation. Um, <clears throat> when you arrived, I think the committee's consensus view was that it was around 3% nominal, 1% in real terms. Um, it seems to have come down a lot. Uh, where is neutral now, and what, what are the unusual forces that are causing neutral to be so much lower than in the past? Yeah, uh, uh, a, great, a great question. Uh, and one, certainly, as you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about both before and since I arrived at the, um, at, at the Fed. So I do think there's a new neutral uh, globally. Before the crisis, if you look at empirical estimates, uh, the US, Europe, UK were operating uh, with, with interest rates that were uh, about 2% plus inflation, so say in the range of four to five neutral nominal rates. Um, and I believe for some time, going back to 2014, that neutral for the US is in the range of two to three, not four to five. So why is that? You are correct that the committee, the median, so we're all into distributions at the Fed. So the median participant believes that uh, the longer run neutral rate is two and a half uh, percent. Um, um, when that question was first asked of the committee in 2012, every participant thought the neutral rate was above 4%. So over the last eight years, there's a dramatic decline. And again, that just reflects the fact um, that um, what we would expect to see in the economy with a higher neutral rate just does not materialize, so we've revised that down. So the question is, why is neutral lower? And I think the important thing for folks here to understand um, is um, there's a substantial common global component to neutral rates, both as a matter of economic theory and what we observe in the data. So it's not a coincidence that the ECB's estimate of neutral and the Bank of England's estimate of neutral and the BOJ's have all declined. They've declined because we have an integrated global capital market. What has happened? We have a global slowdown in productivity growth. We have aging demographics that created create demand for safe, riskless assets. Um, we have um, changes in the financial system that created demand for safe, riskless assets. And you add all that together in an integrated global capital market, all those forces together are pushing down neutral rates. Now, our estimates are imprecise. Uh, there are standard error bands uh, around them. But I think it's really indisputable that, that neutral rates globally uh, are, are lower, and that's an important fact of life for central banks. Does this mean that even if U.S. economic data and fundamentals seem to be improving, that what the Fed do is somewhat constrained by events abroad, that the U.S. neutral rate might have to remain low, uh, even if the fundamentals that typically determine that, like growth and unemployment and inflation, mm -hmm. might would otherwise call for a higher rate? Yeah. I guess I would phrase it a bit differently. I would say we, we need to respect that there's a global uh, component to this, and we need to factor that into our calculation. I, I'll stay right now. I don't think we are constrained now. We have the policy that we want uh, in place, but that policy reflects, obviously, the fact that the funds rate range is one and a half to one and three quarters is reflecting that downshift in neutral. But but I do think, Greg, that relative to where, uh, for example, the, the situation confronted by the ECB or or uh, Japan, it's important to note that under, under uh, you know, Ben and Chair Lennon, Yellen and continuing under, under Chair Powell, the US has been able to move away from the zero bound to get interest rates up. And, and we certainly have uh, the capacity to use the policy instrument, uh, whereas perhaps other central banks don't. And, and, and it's also important to remember that. So in late 2018, as the committee was uh, moving to normalize interest rates, this was around the time you came aboard, yeah. we also saw, saw a, a fairly substantial tightening in global financial conditions yeah. and a strengthening of the dollar. And as you know, um, the committee changed course, altered its bias, and then you, you've talked about the uh, uh, reduction in rates that happened last year. Were those events in 2018 perhaps evidence that the U.S. had started to move a bit further than the global neutral rate uh, would have um, recommended? Well, certainly about, about that, I would, I would point out a couple of things. The first is we ended up in December of 2018 moving up the target range for the federal funds rate to 2.5%, which at the time and, and to this day was the, committee, the lower end of the committee's estimate of neutral. Um, so I think the way to look at that cycle, and Chair Yellen said this at the time, and as a Fed watcher, I complimented it for it. You know, most of the period from 2015 uh, through 2018, the Fed was really not running a tight policy. It was removing accommodation. Uh, 
And really only in September of 2015 did the funds rate move above the underlying rate of inflation. I see Mickey here. You know, we certainly think of funds rate below inflation as September typically. September 2015 or September 2018? Well, in, in September 2018, we it found I misspoke. We moved the funds rate above of inflation. So I think a fair reading of, of, that, of that period was really a period of policy normalization, not to be running necessarily a tight policy, but to get policy up to neutral with 3% growth and a 50-year low of unemployment. So what changed in 2019? Well, I think several factors changed. The first is that uh, the global economy slowed a lot more than we and others projected. Um, underlying trends in inflation uh, indicated that, that we were not staying at our 2% rate uh, of, uh, of inflation. Uh, and as I mentioned, we kept getting good news in the labor market that indicated that we needed to respect the, the real possibility that the labor market could operate with a lower rate of unemployment uh, than we might have previously thought. And so those factors together, along with these muted global inflation pressures, uh, persuaded a majority of the committee, and certainly myself and, and the others who voted for it, that it was appropriate to provide some adjustment at this point um, in the business cycle. And of course, as you know, Greg, because you were covering it at, at, at the time, um, you know, this is something that's not on, this is basically textbook monetary policy. Chair Greenspan in 95, for example, after hiking rates, uh, went through a period in which rates were adjusted by 75 basis points. And the expansion continued for another five uh, years. And so I think in sum, we felt that in 2018, we were getting policy up into the, into the neighborhood of neutral. And then as the global economy slowed and inflation proved to be uh, more muted than we forecasted, we adjusted. Um, one of your colleagues, uh, uh, a staff economist at the Fed, uh, Michael Kiley, yeah. uh, recently put out a staff paper, which, as we all know, does not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Open Market Committee. But he addressed this question of what has been the global factor in the U.S. neutral rate. And uh, the bottom line was that using a variety of models, he suggested that using U.S. factors alone, the real neutral funds rate was around zero, which is to say around 2% nominal. Yeah. But when you actually add these global factors, it was negative one or uh, 1% yeah. uh, nominal. What do you think of those estimates? Does that sound you know, directionally about right? That seems low to me. I have enormous respect for Mike. He's one of our top uh, researchers. Um, again, as you mentioned, <laughs> those are not the, review, the views of, of the committee or the board of governors. But this is very solid research. And I think it indicates there are a range of estimates that we need to be attuned uh, to that. But no, those particular numbers do seem low to me. But even if the levels are perhaps, you know, not where you are, but is the contribution, which is basically global factors have reduced the neutral rate by about a full percentage point in the United States. Yeah. Does that sound about, would you be, uh, does that sound about right to you? Uh, let me, let me get a little bit academic here. I think there are different concepts of neutral floating around. I like to focus on the longer run concept. Where do you, where do you think the neutral rate will end up after the cycle plays out, and I've not changed my view on that. Uh, my dot has not moved since I got to the Fed. I'm not, as vice chair, I'm not allowed to reveal which one it is, but, but, it, is not, but, it, but it has not moved. Um, and, uh, but, but certainly, there's a related concept, which is the short run uh, neutral, um, and that can move around for a variety of reasons, including global developments and, and policy. Um, I think that, to me, frankly, Greg, that's a less useful concept, because in the academic literature to which I contributed, you can attribute almost any move in a policy rate to, to neutral, and that's a little bit of a, a, little bit of a, uh, a stretch. And so let's just say my long-run estimate of neutral uh, remains uh, un, unchanged. And I, but I would say in that context that policy is now providing some accommodation. We are running a rate that's below our estimate of neutral and okay. my estimate of neutral. Let's talk a bit about what you're going to do uh, going forward. I know that yeah. you mentioned you have this framework review, which is all about seeing whether you have the tools and the framework necessary for dealing with uh, macroeconomic challenges. Um, you know, the former Federal Reserve Chairman, uh, Ben Bernanke, uh, gave a talk this past weekend in San Diego where he talked about the extent to which new tools like quantitative easing and forward guidance can um, supplement the interest rate going forward. And he's, he estimated that quantitative easing and forward guidance can contribute three percentage points, the equivalent yeah. of three percentage points of ease. So if the neutral rate is, say, two and a half, then that's like having five and a half points of, um, of uh, monetary ammunition. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think of those estimates? I mean, he, that would suggest that there is, uh, that the Fed doesn't really have to worry about running out of ammunition and hitting the zero lower bound. Okay, well, a couple of things that I certainly have read Ben's uh, paper, read everything that, that he does. 
Um, and I'd like to say at first, I think an important benefit of not only Ben's paper, but similar analysis that we're doing um, is to to focus attention on the fact that tools such as forward guidance and quantitative easing uh, should not be viewed as, as exotic. They, we have said they, are, they will be part of our toolkit in the next uh, uh, downturn, and I think one of the contributions of Ben's paper was to provide some, some quantification of perhaps the, you know, the, uh, the, the value that those tools can play. I think there are a range of estimates uh, there, so I wouldn't necessarily endorse the, the particular number in Ben's uh, paper, but certainly we've said uh, we we can adjust the policy rate. I, I myself uh, believe that forward guidance uh, under appropriate circumstances uh, can be a very powerful tool uh, in the in, in in the toolkit. Uh, and there are different flavors and different ways to implement uh, forward guidance. Uh, what I would say on quantitative easing, and I gave a speech at the Swiss National Bank in, in November where I elaborated on on. On this point, I'm in the camp to think that the quantitative easing programs put in place uh, during the crisis uh, were uh, effective and did have an effect on easing uh, financial uh, conditions. But the estimates are imprecise, um, and 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 moreover, uh, uh, I think on a going forward basis, what I need to think about is whether or not an application of these uh, of this quantitative easing tool could be expected to deliver you know, the same bang for basis point. And it may well be the case. That was Ben's argument in his paper. Uh, but the law of diminishing returns is a very powerful force in economics. And so we also have to be concerned that it may also apply to quantitative easing as well. So I think Ben's paper is a very valuable contribution, but I wouldn't necessarily endorse the particular nu numerical uh, estimate there. The other important point, since you mentioned it, is Ben emphasizes that his his outlook um, um, based on that paper is predicated on an assumption uh, that going into the next recession that the underlying neutral rate will be, say, in the 2 to 3% range. And he argues that if going into the next recession it's not, then you actually don't have as much space. So that's an important factor as well. And there, are there reasons to think that, in fact, will, it will actually be dropping going to the next recession for either U.S. or global reasons? Well, that, that would, again, we don't have a crystal ball and we don't sure. think a recession is imminent. But, but if history is any, any guide, uh, you know, typical estimates of neutral do tend to, to begin to, to, uh, to shift down going into a severe downturn. So yeah. that, that's certainly a risk. And is the next downturn likely to be global, and therefore all those global factors will be uh, playing a part? Well, again, no, no crystal ball. But but the re but the reality is is there is a global cycle. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit, it looks a little bit different than it did 30 years ago because of the huge role of China, both in size and growth rate. But there is a global cycle, and certainly I think you know when the t when I up at Columbia when I would teach my course, I talk about the small economy in recession and everybody else. But in reality, there is a global component, and the risk, and see Ben Ben still here, the risk globally is when you have all the major economies going down together, it makes it difficult for any one economy to use any given set of tools. That doesn't mean you don't use them and you can't be effective, but it does impact the, uh, the, the appropriate policy. So you and your foreign colleagues will certainly have your work cut out for you if mm. and when the next uh, cycle turns. Yeah. Um, all right, I think we have some time now to uh, turn to uh, questions and answers. Um, so if you, uh, we'll, we have people with microphones in the audience. If you raise your hand, we'll get you a microphone. Uh, please, um, a reminder that this is on the record. Uh, please state your name. Um, uh, <coughs> if, uh, I would ask the member to state your name uh, before you uh, ask a question. Um, and I think, Fred, I saw your hand up there. A uh, question. Uh, around the world, certainly in this country but elsewhere, uh, legislatures have very little leverage or flexibility on fiscal policy, whether it's raising bus fares in places or gas prices in Chile and so forth, which puts more and more on central banks. So it seems that globally we're going to be relying on central banks to really steer the economy. And do you really have the tools to do that without a fiscal or legislative partner? It's an excellent question, um, and I do believe that obviously uh, in a downturn, you know, textbooks would indicate, and I think experience would confirm, that it's desirable to have both fiscal and monetary policy working together and in the same uh, 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 direction. Um, again, not forecasting a downturn, but certainly generically in a downturn, uh, you would want both policies to be uh, operating 
together. Uh, obviously, you know, we, we, don't, we don't weigh in on fiscal policy in the details, but certainly your general point is one that we would, that we would agree with. Uh, over here. Uh, Paul Sheard, Harvard Paul. Kennedy School. Hi, Rich. Uh, thanks very much for your talk this morning. Maybe an extension, uh, push that uh, first question a little bit further. Um, pivoting back to the review that you've, you're undertaking of the tool oh. strategy communication, um, which has been going on for quite a long time. It sounds like it will be a little bit longer before it comes out. But in the context of that review, you've done this listening to uh, 14 events, taken a lot of inputs, a lot of outreach. Have you had any dialogue or taken any input formally or informally from the relevant parties in the administration or the Congress, particularly apropos of the point that perhaps in a downturn in the future, there will need to be better coordination between monetary and fiscal policy? Well, uh just state that, that the current Fed, like all Feds, has, has regular conversations uh, with other uh, policy uh, uh, makers. I won't go into any of, those, any of those details, but speaking specifically about the review, the review is about, about monetary policy. The review is not about making recommendations for fiscal policy. We have a mandate assigned to us by Congress, which is to run a monetary policy to sustain maximum employment and price stability. Obviously appropriate policy will need to factor in realized and projections of fiscal uh, policy. But let me be very clear on the record, our review is not looking at fiscal policy options. That's not what this is about. Uh, question here. Thank, thank you, Juan Ocampo. Um, Richard, you mentioned there's a number of observations that have kind of uh, gone from, uh, deviated from prior trend like unemployment and so forth. One that also seems to be um, kind of behaving differently is the business cycle itself. Uh, the one that we're in right now is very long in the tooth, but it seems to um, you know, be p pretty frisky. Um, is that something you guys are looking into and kind of thinking maybe that's changed in a, in a major way? Excellent point. So um, in July of 2019, the, the current economic expansion is dated by the National Bureau of Economic Research became the longest um, uh, in, the, in the U.S. data, which I think goes back to the 1850s. Uh, uh, so there may have been a longer expansion in 1821, but we don't know about it. But, uh, um, uh, and, and, and you are correct. You know, there's an old saying, expansions don't die of, of old age. Um, um, and, and certainly this uh, expansion um, uh, appears to be, uh, to be very robust. Um, I've pointed out in several occasions, you know, consumption is 70% of the economy. In my professional career, the U.S. consumer in the aggregate has never been in better shape. You've got um, solid income growth. Households, unlike other parts of the economy, the household sector delevered substantially. Um, obviously, strong labor market wage growth. The savings rate is at a 20-year high, which I view as a positive. Uh, because that means um, households in the aggregate are not overextended. So I think that's a very positive um, uh, development. The financial system um, is much better capitalized. Um, obviously, large banks are subjected to significant stress uh, analyses. Um, and so, you know, broadly speaking, I, I, I would you know, reject uh, any suggestion that just because the expansion's in, in year 11, you know, it's about to end. Again, you know, we get paid to think about downside risk and put in place appropriate policies. Um, but there's no reason whatsoever to think this expansion cannot uh, uh, continue. Okay, uh, back there by the door. Hi, Rich. Um, Joyce Chang Hi, Joyce. from J.P. Morgan. Good to see you, and thanks for your comments. Um, as part of the policy review, are you considering more flexibility with the average inflation target, given the downside risk that you've highlighted? Well, the short answer is yes, we are considering it. Our, our current framework um, would, would be referred to generically as flexible inflation targeting, um, which we share with most of the central banks in, in the world. Um, and under flexible inflation targeting, what you try to do at every point in time is to get inflation to your, to your target, regardless of how you, you got there. So a, a close cousin, but a, a different approach to monetary policy um, is some version of average inflation targeting, where you set policy based upon 
um, the, the, the path that it takes to get there. So for example, under average inflation targeting, if you've spent a number of years below your target, you would try to run a policy that would seek to spend some time above the target. And let me explain why that's potentially um, um, important. Um, it's important because in a world um, in which neutral rates are low that Greg and I discussed, for any given uh, set of shocks, you're more likely to hit the zero lower bound. And at the zero lower bound, you're more likely to have a period where inflation's below target. Um, and so the reason why thinking about average inflation targeting or different variants of that is relevant as part of this review is it's very important. Price stability really requires that expected inflation in, in, in labor markets and in financial markets be anchored at the 2% objective. And average inflation targeting is one way to help anchor inflation expectations at two, in our case, uh, at 2%. What Chair Powell has indicated and what I've said um, is 2% is not a ceiling as far as that policy is concerned. And yet for the combination of shocks and other factors, we've been operating below uh, 2%. Um, and I do think it's important, and the review is thinking about different approaches that uh, would include an element of average inflation targeting. But again, uh, we're continuing this discussion at the committee. It will certainly proceed throughout the first half of, 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 of this year. So nothing definitive to say for you, but it's clearly something that we're, that we're looking at. Uh, uh, yes, there, I um, sort of with your hand up down there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm David Braunschweig. What do you think can be done to fine tune and improve your measurements and metrics of uh, service productivity? For example, the bifurcation between the technology rich and technology poor services in as much as services represent such an important part of the economy and technology plays a role that is often misunderstood. It's a great question. Obviously, um, measurement issues are relevant to the central bank, uh, and particularly in this issue, because um, you know, the, sort of the simple version of this is that if we're if we're understating uh, uh, productivity, we're probably overstating underlying inflation. The Boskin Commission back in the '90s did the landmark study uh, using 1980s data, and at the time estimated that. Uh, traditional measures of inflation, certainly the CPI, were upward biased by about half a percentage um, uh, point. And most of that was due to the fact that we're mismeasuring uh, uh, productivity. Um, so certainly the Fed has a, a, a large and very capable staff uh, that, that are looking into those uh, uh, issues. It's certainly relevant to the way that we think about longer run trends. Frankly, it's not necessarily relevant to the meeting by meeting policy um, uh, uh, decisions, uh, but certainly it is an important an un important part of understanding the uh, understanding the uh, economy. And very just a, one example of that, sir, is a very well known issue in price indexes um, um, is the bias in price indexes when new products are introduced. You know, after all, you know, there was you know the. <laughs> There, there, you know, there was no internet 30 years ago. So, what is the price of internet services, or what is? There are different ways to get at that through so-called hedonic indexes and the like. But I think the one thing we can say for sure is that the the, the cumulative effect of technology means that we are we are understating that level of productivity and probably overstating inflation. The real challenge is how much, and and more importantly, and I'm not an expert on this is there, there have always been measurement issues. And so to have an inflation effect, the measurement issues have to be getting worse. Uh, and there's some reason to think that may be true, but I think it's too soon, too, too, too soon uh, to tell. Uh, yes, right here, please. Thank you, Tara Hariharan, NWI. Sir, Hi. can I ask you to expound a bit further on your brief comments about the repo facility? Yeah. Uh, I know that uh, Chair Powell made it very clear it is not, not, not QE. It's but, not, and it's not, and not, it not, isn't. Not, 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 not QE. <laughs> but um, but um, <laughs> is is there any concern um, within the Fed that uh, the in any kind of tapering of the facility has to be careful because of the concern that this might be like a mini taper tantrum? Okay. All right, so yeah, that, uh, that's a very good question. So let's just give a brief 
uh, recap of, of where we are and how we, we got here. So um, in January of 2019, the committee formally uh, affirmed its desire to have an operating framework in which we seek to operate with an ample level of reserves. And in that framework, the interest that we pay on, on reserves, the so-called IOER uh, rate, really becomes the policy um, uh, instrument. Um, and um, and as, a, as a consequence of that, we know that we're going to be operating with a level of reserves in the financial system much larger than we did before the crisis because we had a different operating uh, uh, framework. Um, we announced uh, and then implemented in July of 2019 that we we're going to stop shrinking the balance sheet. So we stopped shrinking the balance sheet in 2019. Um, and at the time, we indicated that at some point we would need to start growing the balance sheet again in line with the organic demand for our uh, liabilities. The important thing to uh, remember um, is that there are nearly $2 trillion of currency outstanding uh, globally, half of which is actually outside the U.S. And, and currency is a zero interest loan to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, to the government. And so there are factors that, that tend to reduce uh, reserves, including currency uh, demand. Uh, so fast forward to September of 2019. In September of 2019, there was obviously a very, very uh, notable disruption in the repo market, not directly in the federal funds market, but, but in the repo market. And obviously, they're tightly linked. Um, and for one day, the market clearing federal funds rate actually briefly moved the top of our target range. So as a result of that, the committee decided in October uh, to, to resume uh, organic growth in the balance sheet. So we're purchasing treasury bills uh, at a pace of $60 billion, uh, a month. And we've also had in place repo operations, uh, both overnight and especially at year end, some term repo uh, operations. And as I mentioned in my uh, remarks, um, they were uh, successful uh, in avoiding any excessive year end volatility in the, in the repo market. But let me, let me be very clear. I said it in my speech, but I want to say it again. Um, the, the focus of the Federal Reserve is to have an operating framework that helps us to keep the federal funds rate in the target range. We're not targeting uh, the repo uh, rate. Obviously, rates are interconnected, and, and if there's difficulty in liquidity uh, uh, flowing in the system, then we want to be attentive and attuned uh, to uh, that. But the plan that we announced in October is to continue the pace of T-bill purchases through the second quarter of this year. As the minutes of our December meeting uh, indicated, we were briefed by the staff of the New York Fed at the December meeting um, that it could well make sense uh, for us to continue the repo operations uh, after January, but to gradually begin to uh, reduce their uh, size. And so that's obviously something that we will be uh, discussing at our upcoming, uh, upcoming uh, meeting. Uh, but ultimately, we do think that the plan we announced in October and that we are implementing uh, will get reserves uh, up to the ample uh, level. Uh, and, that, and once we get to that point, uh, certainly we would not be expecting to have uh, ongoing uh, large repo operations as necessary. Thanks. Uh, yes, right there, please, in this middle table. Bob. Hi, Bob Hormat. Thanks, 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 Rich, for a great presentation. I wonder if you could comment on sort of a medium-term question. That is, what's tending to happen now as a result of relatively low interest rates is a lot of leveraging um, federal, state, yeah. and triple B corporates and others. <coughs> and that's all quite comfortable in this current interest rate environment. But in an environment in which rates go up or the economy weakens, what looks like comfortable debt servicing obligations can become very uncomfortable. My concern, I wonder if you share this concern, is that at a given point, if rates start going up, there's going to be an inordinate amount of pressure coming from the federal government or states or corporates on the Fed to do something about it. In other words, if, the, if that, in effect, starts imposing a burden on the economy, uh, then are you under a greater degree of pressure than you otherwise would be to take monetary policy action to offset the excessive borrowing or the enthusiastic borrowing that's taken place in this um, more uh, comfortable environment? 
It's an excellent question, and, and one of the, um, one of the uh, innovations uh, that Chair Powell has brought to the Fed is that now we publish uh, twice a year financial stability uh, report. Um, we did two of them last year, and we'll do, continue to do two a year. And the most recent financial stability report appeared uh, in uh, November, and we dedicated a lot of space in that report precisely to developments in, 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 the corporate, in corporate leverage. And so leverage levels uh, are high. I, you know, not a surprise with rates low that companies will take advantage of that. I do think it's also important to note that corporate leverage is definitely elevated relative to where it was a decade ago. Uh, but it's also the case that in the aggregate, corporations have used this period of low rates to extend the term of their debt. And so you also have to factor in not only the absolute amount of leverage, but also, you know, in essence, the rollover risk in the, in the market. So we're looking at that as, as well. Uh, but I think more broadly what your question uh, suggests is certainly something that we think about and that all central banks uh, think about, um, which is the appropriate balance um, and availability of tools to deal with potential issues in the financial uh, system. And what the Fed has traditionally said, as do most central banks, is that your first choice is to deal with any potential issue uh, using macro prudential uh, tools uh, and to save monetary policy for maximum employment and price stability. That all sounds good you know, in theory and in, in practice. I think the reality is that the toolkit of financial, of, of macro prudential tools is perhaps not as, as, uh, as, 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 as well stocked uh, as we liked. And so these are always judgments that we're having uh, uh, to make. It's certainly a very relevant factor. Uh, both Vice Chair Quarles and Governor Brainerd spent a lot of time, uh, and of course our staff as well. So we're certainly not ignoring it. Uh, 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 I, we think it is an issue in the financial uh, system, uh, but um, you know, we're just, I think the, the short answer is we're, we're alert to it and, and keeping our eye on it. Uh, Richard, if I yeah. may, I think yeah. there's another element to Bob's question, yeah. which was that the very large federal debts we have mean that any action you take on interest rates will have major implications for federal financing. To what extent would any sort of financial or political pressure coming from that end affect any decision that the committee makes on the appropriate stance of monetary policy? Well, certainly political pressure would have no factor. Again, we, we have to take monetary policy based on the outlook for the uh, economy. And obviously, fiscal developments are an input into that. But we, we take the fiscal policy as, as exogenous and as determined by the Congress uh, and, um, and, the, um, um, and, and, and the White House. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, right here. Hi, Robin Meredith from Bank of New York Mellon. Hello. You talked earlier about the global disinflationary pressure that you are seeing. I think by that you meant negative interest rates in Europe, et cetera. But could you talk a bit about, you know, go into some depth on trade? Um, the trade war, it seems to me, has meant that we're increasingly at least having tar on the tracks of globalization, which held prices down before. Yeah. And if we are indeed moving into a world in which the giant economy centered on China and the giant economy centered on, or the giant trade centered US, uh, on the U.S. are bifurcating into two separate worlds. What will that mean? Is that something you guys are thinking about? Okay, so there are, I think, two elements to your question. Let me address them uh, in, in turn. Um, so um, the global disinflationary forces that I was referring to, I think low rates are sort of a, an implication, sort of reflecting that. But I, I'm really referring to the fact that um, at least for traded goods, obviously big chunks of the consumption basket is non-traded, but at least for those parts of the economy exposed to tradable goods, what you observe in the, in the official data. So in a year when inflation is 2%, what's going on is that services inflation is 3 and goods inflation is minus 1. And this has been evident in the data now for 15 um, um, uh, years. And I won't even get into sort of the ancillary aspects of digitization and, and, and all of that. But just physical goods trade is prices are falling in absolute terms. Um, and, and so you have these important relative price changes. Now, you actually, I think, are suggesting um, what I would call a you know, hypothetical or a, a scenario where there may be a scenario where there's such a, a U-turn in, in global relationships that those global disinflationary forces um, abate, 
Obviously, that is a scenario. That's not the scenario that we think that we're observing. I would point out in the official U.S. data for last year, even though there were some, obviously, some, some tariffs put in place on imported goods, uh, import prices actually fell last year. So um, uh, the, the, the overall disinflationary forces, we think, are still, uh, are still uh, very relevant. But longer term, you, know, you are correct. If you really were to have a, 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 you know, a sea change uh, in the way that uh, global trade uh, e uh, evolves, then obviously that would have an effect on, on inflation and we would have to think about it. But that, uh, we don't think that's where we are right now. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Luke Hayden. I'm identified in the council as the chairman of the Markle Foundation, but before I retired for 10 years, I was responsible at Citigroup for all the control functions and had a lot of interaction with your predecessors and your colleagues from essentially all of the central banks and the major okay. financial centers around the world because of Citi's international footprint. And I wanted to ask you if you could comment on what you see as the current challenges um, on the supervisory and regulatory side. And I can say that uh, when I retired after a period of time, I felt somewhat free to comment about the experience I had around the world uh, during the crisis and afterward and in a series of speeches and some writings. I said, I thought, while the US banking system was more resilient than its counterparts in Europe, uh, the Asia story is more complicated, but the US overall was quite resilient, and that's reflected in the economic performance of the major financial institutions in the recent period as, as well. But my own view is that the underlying challenges coming out of the crisis are still there, and I summarized it in some of the writing and lectures that I gave as categorized in uh, culture, ethics, and talent. And I don't think that those have been entirely addressed, even in the successful uh, large institutions in the US. And when you move elsewhere around the world, the underlying issues are even more severe because the institutions are less resilient, with some exceptions, like some of the best of the Japanese and some special cases. There's a lot of talent and potential in China, for example, including in the national uh, banks. But the system needs so much work, and the best of the policymakers understand that, but that doesn't mean that they're any more speedy in the reform program than other parts of their system. So I wonder if you could comment a bit on the, on the supervisory part of your responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a couple of things on that. First of all, uh, the Dodd-Frank uh, Act created a new position, which is a vice chairman for supervision and regulation. And the first person to fill that is my colleague and good friend, Randall Quarles, who's just doing a, a remarkable uh, uh, job. Uh, some, I, I get a briefing every week either from Randy or his staff just to keep up with the flurry of ideas coming out of his shop. But, but more broadly, um, the, uh, the U.S. financial uh, system um, is um, in a much more robust uh, place uh, than it was a dozen years ago. Obviously, our focus are on the, the big banks and the banks that we oversee and regulate, but whether or not you're looking at levels of capital or liquidity, resiliency to stress testing uh, uh, resolution. Um, and so during my confirmation hearing, I was asked about this, and I said, you know, these are very, very important improvements, and certainly uh, anything that I vote on or I think about would want to respect and maintain all of those benefits. That being said, uh, one of the themes uh, and one of the motivations uh, in uh, our approach to uh, financial regulation has been where appropriate and without any uh, cost or inefficiency to, to tailor regulations um, um, as appropriate, in particular, less by size of institution and more by lines of business and systemic risk. And the CRAPO uh, bill, uh, which passed the Congress in the spring of uh, 20, 
uh, 18, uh, actually laid down some very specific markers about how to do that. And so much of my time at the Fed in the last 15 months has been implementing, uh, have been, has been uh, putting in place the, the regulations to implement uh, that. Uh, but, but all of us are very attuned uh, to uh, the, the need to be alert. Uh, it's a very complex financial system. You point out to the complexities in globally, different countries and different continents have different approaches uh, to this. Um, and one of the things that I've observed in my, in my time at the, uh, at the, at the board, um, and one of the big, oftentimes you get asked, what's your biggest surprise? And one of my biggest surprises um, is that as, a, um, as an academic and a Fed watcher for decades, I had the luxury uh, of just focusing my attention on one important but very specific thing the Fed does, which is eight times a year it either raises interest rates or lowers rates or does nothing. But once you get inside the building, you realize the, the complexity and I would argue the interplay between the monetary policy decisions and the supervision uh, and, and uh, regulation. Um, and I, what I found when I'm thinking about monetary policy is I really also want to understand the supervision and regulation piece and, and vice versa. So I, I think it is important to think of them together um, as a package. Uh, but broadly speaking, at least with regard to the U.S. financial system, um, um, you know, I think it's in very, very good shape, and the post-crisis uh, changes in supervision and regulation have been very positive. Um, very quickly on yeah. that, Rich. Um, obviously, monetary policy cannot directly do much about inequality and the gaps between rich and poor, but yeah. perhaps on the payments and supervisory side, there is some role here. And uh, under the chairmanship of Jerome Powell, for example, we have seen uh, the Fed um, move forward on its own real-time payment system. Yeah. And uh, we've, there's an interesting discussion going on right now on, on changes to the Community Reinvestment Act. Does the Federal Reserve, in those, re, in those roles, in your view, does it have some responsibility to so narrow some of the inequities we've seen in our economy? Well, let's talk about CRA first and then, and then uh, talk about the other element of your uh, question. So the Community Reinvestment Act uh, is a statute, 1977. Uh, I believe, um, and so both Chair Powell and, and Governor Brainerd, who are taking the lead, who's taking the lead on this uh, for us. But we all believe that our 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 job is to effectively uh, interpret the CRA in a way that's consistent and fully in line with both the letter and the spirit of the CRA. Now the world is a lot different than it was 40 years ago. So it would be naive to think that the CRA doesn't deserve. Uh, occasionally to, 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 to be uh, refined. Um, and we've certainly indicated that we're open uh, to doing uh, that. But I think in terms of our motivation, our motivation is it's the law of the land and we want to faithfully put in place regulations that, that reflect that law and that also are attentive to the world and the financial system in which we, uh, uh, we, which, which we live. Um, we have spent time during our Fed listens uh, events and did have a staff briefing in our number meeting, as the as the minutes uh, revealed, um, on the interplay between monetary policy um, and and income distribution. So let me talk a little bit about why we're doing that. Um, and the main reason we're doing that is very very practical. To understand the right monetary policy to put in place, we have to understand the transmission mechanism between policy and the economy. And in fact. We can get a better sense of the transmission mechanism if we move away from a representative agent to a world where you've got different consumers with different access to credit, and different exposures to different risks. Um, and I think the reason why we're only focusing on this now is uh, economists have known for, for decades uh, that that would make sense. The challenge is, is those models tend to be more complex, and we really now just have the modeling capability to have a more nuanced and granular view of the financial system. So the primary motivation for looking at distribution uh, is really to give us a better sense of how we can put in place um, policies. You know, that being said, I think what we, br broadly speaking, um, what we're really focused on is maximum employment and price stability, and if we can consistently achieve that, um, that's going to have a very favorable impact. You know, certainly, for a person who's unemployed, getting a job does a lot for his income distribution, so or her distribution. Thank you. So. I think we have time for perhaps one uh, one more. Um, uh, yes, there. So, so to totally change the subject and yeah. come down to earth, you probably know there's a network of central banks. Christine Lagarde, 
Mark Carney, leading it uh, with regard to how monetary policy may or may not be able to respond to the climate change question. Yes, yeah. And I would be curious to know, the U.S. is nowhere in that leadership, and I just wondered if it reaches your level of discussion. Thank you. Well, certainly uh, what, what, what Chair Powell and us have, have indicated, that we are certainly uh, very, very, we're following those efforts uh, uh, closely, um, and in particular in our international uh, discussions in the G20 and in the, at, the, at the BIS and others, we're certainly engaged in those, in, in those conversations. Just recently, uh, Governor Brainerd gave a speech uh, on climate change and monetary policy. And since we have limited time, I won't synthesize her speech for you, but it, it will give you a good snapshot of where, of where we are in that uh, right now. Um. Your colleague Robert Kaplan was uh, in San Diego. He said that their research has found that extreme weather events, leaving aside whether monetary policy can do anything about climate change, yeah. extreme weather uh, events have become more frequent and more regular yeah. and more extreme. And that alone seems to be changing economic outcomes. Do you agree? Do you see that happening? Well, I certainly agree that, uh, that, that uh, tr traditionally the Fed, especially in our regulation uh, and supervision capacity, uh, at the individual bank level has always been focused on exposure of banks to extreme weather events. You can think of parts of the world where that country where that's very relevant. And as we've indicated publicly, you know, to the extent that extreme weather events are more, more frequent or more extreme, that that does need to be factored into the way that we assess whether or not banks have adequate capital and risk um, exposure. Okay. So I think Rob is exactly right. All right, Rich, thank you very much. Thank it's been you, a Greg. Very good discussion. Appreciate it. Thank you.